So I bring greetings from uh, the Alta Fellowship uh, in Johnson City in Tennessee. Um, they laid hands on Chris and I just last Sunday as we uh, and sent us over here with their blessing. A bit like you, Pastor Bill, they also said, but y'all got to come back. <laughs> so uh, we're kind of like people who are stuck between two worlds. Um, it's Christmas time, and I feel like I have a word for you as a church, and that word for you is to start believing for more. Okay, believe for more. Lift your expectations. It's not same old, same old. And I'm going to show you a couple of images here. In this service here, you will get one picture that the other two services did not get. So hold on to your seats. I'm going to jump straight away into Revelation chapter 19. Now, I'm not going to do a lot about the book of Revelation. As Pastor Bill said, I ended up, you'd, you'd have to write a book in order to be able to really set the scene for understanding the book of Revelation. It's probably the, the most intriguing book of the entire Bible and probably, for that reason, the least understood. And uh, it's actually a very easy book to understand. It is not difficult at all. In short, think in terms of Lord of the Rings that's got a Bible message weaved through its story. And then if you do that, you're actually going to go pretty close to uh, finding it all out. Okay, it is not a panorama of the end times. We're in the end times. We've been in the end times ever since Jesus set foot on this planet. And you, like, you only have to hear Peter talking on Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, and he's saying, men and brothers, these are not drunk as you suppose, but this is what the prophet Joel said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Like he's prophesying from Joel, Joel was saying in the last days all God's people would be prophetic, and he says this is what this is. Peter saw himself as being in the last days there and then, just months uh, down the track. Well, in fact, it wasn't even months down the track from the resurrection. It's a, it's a very, very short period of time. It is not even, uh, it's just, it's a month and a half after the resurrection, not long at all. So the book of Revelation is not about what's going to happen at the end. It is a sermon about what Jesus is doing in the world and what he's doing in the church and how the church is interacting with the world and where God is in the whole mix and particularly for Christian churches that are suffering persecution. And so that's basically the whole story of the revelation. So it's not like one vision, it is lots of visions. And here is one, it is coming to the end of the book and so we're coming to the finale, the climax of the story and we're just going to jump straight in because... Uh, in order to see it, we're going to uh, look at the rider on the white horse. So it's in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 onwards. And are you going to be with me on the screen? Just, you get, yeah, like, look at that, you've got it. Um, you're going to have to figure it, yeah, that's better. <laughs> I get in trouble, Pastor Bill, because uh, I get so cheeky with whoever's on the screen back there that... Sometimes I uh, make it so hard for them that they're really thick-skinned. Um, the only ones who last the distance are like, because like, yeah, you got like the cool beanie on and just like, you got me, you got me covered? Because if you don't, I got the microphone. Mind you, I'm, I'm scared of that man just there beside you because I do have the microphone, but he's actually got the power. So... <laughs> He's a good man, like just, I respect you. <laughs> when the service is over, then we'll talk. <laughs> Verse 11, chapter 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judge, judges and makes war. I really can never go past that verse, because this is a picture of Jesus that a lot of Christians don't have. This, our Jesus is a, is a, is a saviour, yes he is, but he is a fierce saviour. He judges and he makes war. 
Now, we can misunderstand what that looks like because a lot of Christians will pick up on those kind of images and then they become judgmental and start railing against other people whose lifestyle they might not agree with and completely forgetting the story that in Ephesians 6 it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, okay? And that's actually, there's a revelation in there for a lot of Christians, I think, who actually feel that it's their duty. Like, I'm in America. You've got to believe the social media rhetoric that gets around the country. You would think that God is Republican if you're in America. You know, and it's really hard to be Democrat if you're in in the South and a Christian. I mean, I I'm just need to let you know that God is neither Democrat nor Republican. Like, those guys can align themselves with him, but he doesn't align themselves with them. It's like, our saviour is not a political forum. We all have political aspirations and beliefs and, and ideals. You know, we have, we have standards and ethics of, by which we think a country ought to be governed. And we have this wonderful facility within us in the West where we, we have democracies, where we can vote in a government, we can have our voice be heard. Um, but like, I mean, our hope is not in that because no matter how good a political party might be, they will necessarily fall short. And unfortunately, living in that community, what happens is that, is that there is such a, an ideologically almost bizarre left-wing agenda that comes across in our country, in America, and, and I know it's here too. It's just like you can almost feel, get Christians who feel like it's their duty to, to castigate people who believe something different. And uh, it's, it's not good. It's, it's not the gospel. Jesus loves all people. You know, does Jesus love this kind of person or that kind of, just, can we just get people to hear about Jesus and let Jesus work those things out with them about their lifestyle down the track? Can we stop being judgment, judgmental? It's Jesus, he, is, he's, he judges. That's actually a fair comment though. He does judge. We all stand before his judgment seat. Sobering thought that there will be a day that you will stand before him. I hope you're clothed in his righteousness rather than your own because we all will stand before him. He judges and makes war. <clears throat> okay, go back some centuries and you would think Christians ended up thinking that, oh, well, that means we're supposed to go and make war against the infidels. And I think we're going to find something very different in this passage if we just keep reading it. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And one of the things Pastor Bill and I were just talking about up in his office just before this service was, you know, there's, there's an aspect of relationship with Jesus that is so important for us to have. And that is he's got eyes like fire. He, is, he burns through. He looks into your heart. He knows your motivations. He knows the good. He knows the bad. He knows it all. And he looks with eyes of fire. That can be a frightening thing, but it also can be a liberating thing because if you allow him with his burning eyes to look into your inner world, you will see that he will not only just expose that between you and him, but he'll burn it out too. He's faithful and just not only to forgive us of all sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you struggle with an issue in your life, and it might be a hereditary thing too, you know, oh, my father was always an angry man and his father was an angry man and his father before him was an angry man. So, of course, I'm an angry man. Of course, I just fly off the handle and, and, I'm, and I'm abusive because it's the way of my people. No, it's not. Jesus knows how to make you a new creation. The old can be gone, really is. It's not, more, it's not just a Bible verse that's sitting there for you. Okay, he's got eyes of fire. Let's keep going on. Um, and on his head were many crowns. 
Right? This, is, this is someone who's important. This is someone who, who conquers. It's not just his own crown that he wears. He wears yours and mine. Like, you know, when I became a Christian, I bowed my knee to him. Like I say, uh, like one of my fun things that I'll say to people over in America, because like, you know, th they're kind of like desperate for Christine and I to, to stay behind there. Um, we kind of like have sons and daughters everywhere through East Tennessee now. Um, and I'm like granddad, really, just, it is odd for me to be in a worship time and not have a kid that I'm cradling. And of course, because we're like the bluegrass central, then I'm jumping up and down. Like, you've got to be fit to be in our church. Like, you know, just like, I'll end up stripping off just because I'm, I'm sweating like anything. And with these little tiny kids, and I'll have, you know, so many people just like, now, now you're coming back, aren't you? You, have, you can't go. You, like, you know, I know that you're doing a visa run, and I know that the visa is going to finish in 2024, but you are going to apply for a green card, aren't you? Like, because we need you to stay here. Like, you just, and one of the things that I'll sit down and talk with them all, it's a revelation that every one of us here need to have, is that you have to understand I'm, I'm under orders. I'm on assignment. I'm, I'm here because Jesus said to me to come here. And if Jesus says for me to stay here, I will stay here. But if Jesus says for me, to move somewhere else, I will move somewhere else. You know, I've even very quietly just toyed with the idea of doing a stint over in England with our CRC work over there. Like, you know, if, if Jesus says that, that's what Ian and Christine will do because our life is not our own. And why is that? Because when I bowed my knee to Jesus, I probably didn't realise it at the time, but I took my own crown off and I put it on him. And I just said, you a Lord. All right, let's keep reading on. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Wonder what that is. You know that, you know that when it talks about the name of Jesus or the name of God, you, you know that they all have meanings. You know, you know that uh, the, old, the Old Testament has, uh, calls him the Lord and it will call him Lord with uh, all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Whenever you see that, it's actually a Hebrew name. Uh, we, we are pretty well, pretty confident that we've got it right that we know what the word is because it was lost to history because it was never spoken by the Jewish people after about the second century, I think, Finally, it died, but it was, it was dying out well before the time of Christ even, where we say Yahweh, Y-H-W-H -H is the actual only letters that we know were the true letters. And uh, it's most, most probable that it was Yahweh because in, uh, in, in the Greek Septuagint, there's a couple of uh, times where it's Yao. So you can see, okay, it's, we're probably right with all of that. But the word itself, Yahweh, is the causative of the verb to be. I cause to be. That's what the word actually says. I cause this to be. It's a creator word. You know, when El Shaddai, uh, we, we translate it as, as uh, the Almighty. And uh, El Shaddai is El is God and Shaddai is the plural of a woman's, of a woman's breast. Um, and it's, it's, it's their Hebrew word for the nurturer, the one who sustains us, the one who suckles us at his breast. It's a very feminine picture of God. You know, there's all these, all these pictures and names. Jesus, the name Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua, same as Joshua. It's, it's saviour. You will call his name Yeshua because he will save his people from their sins. Now, for us, it just sounds like Jesus. But for them, you will call his name Saviour because he will save his people from their sins. It's just like, whoa. Um, so he's got a name on him that nobody knows. Like there is something about Jesus himself that is still a mystery. You don't know it all. So don't be so dogmatic with everything. I don't like it when I see dogmatic Christians who just like they figured out theology and the Bible and, you know, 
They just say, well, I believe the Bible. Unbeknownst to them, a lot of other people do too, come up with different ideas. I'm not sure that Jesus is that concerned, to be honest, about how pure your doctrine is. I think he's more concerned about how pure your relationship with him is and how, how intimately you pursue him uh, in pursuit of all things true. Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. It's baptised in blood in Greek. Um, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Whose blood do you think that is? Uh, no secret, it's his. He's got a bloodied robe. And his name is called the Word of God. It takes you back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word, you know, was God. You know, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. You know, John 1.14. It's just like, like there's something even mysterious about that. That when God wants to make a statement of ultimate truth, he doesn't write a thing at all. He shows us a person. No one has ever seen God except God the one and only who is in the bosom of the Father. He's declared him. So it's just like God wants to reveal himself to his creation because he's a loving creator. And because of, of the crisis and tragedy of our inner world, our moral world, we've become separate and distant to him. We've become lost. Jesus is the Word, the Word become flesh. Okay, so it's not just the, the book. Jesus, Jesus is like, whoa. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. I, uh, I noted to the... Uh, Friday service that it's really interesting because in the original language it says and he himself will shepherd them with a rod of iron it's just really interesting it's just a it's it's a it's a pastor word rather than a lordship word um, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords where I want to go with this message is just to underline and underscore one little part of this beautiful and intense message. And we could just have a thousand sermons just on this passage, I'm sure of it. Jesus is on a white horse. He's got a robe on. It's covered in blood. He has tread out the wine press of the fury and wrath of God Almighty. Deal with that as you will. You know, I think, I think for too long we've had this gentle giant up in the sky called, called God. And I do, I do fear that the fear of God is missed in large portions of, of the Christian community across the globe. There is a, like the fear of God is fear. It really is fear. It's not reverence. Well, reverence is the outcome of it, but if you were standing literally in the presence, in the physical presence of Almighty God, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm on my face. You don't get on your face because you say, oh, I love you so much. You know, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is real. <laughs> he is nothing like us. Okay, here he is, riding the horse. His clothes are drenched in blood, his own blood, because he has done this amazing transaction between us. He has stood in our place, there in the winepress of the fury and wrath of God. Do you think that God is happy about all the injustice that's in our world? Do you think that God just winks an eye and doesn't care about murders and rapes and and injustice and trafficking and do you think that God doesn't care about all those injustices? And, and you know, it's easy to say, yes, I know that he, he cares about those things, but where are you gonna draw your line? How pure is he? 
if he hates, if he hates like rape, how far back does it go before it's like, oh, it's okay, he's not too upset with this one. Just like how clean is he? How pure is he? Because Jesus himself said, if you look with wrong intent in your eyes at a woman, he's talking to men, if you look with wrong intent at them, you've, you've broken that commandment. What he's saying to them is you are not clean like he is clean. And if you think that he's outraged by sin and injustice, you have to understand that he is absolutely, totally, 100% amazingly pure. He's outraged by all of it, every last little drop of it. And that's why we need a saviour, because none of us are going to survive that. If, he's that. if he's that outraged about absolutely everything, then my goodness me, we're all in trouble. And the oldest in here are the most in trouble because we've had the most time to get it wrong. Like, but don't worry, all you young ones, you, like you have too. Just, we're all together on this. Okay, here he is. He's, he's made this transaction. He has stood in our place so that we can stand in his place. It's this beautiful thing because have a look at the army that was there um, in verse uh, 14. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. We're like, like we're on those white horses ourselves. That verse, oh, it's just there. No, I want verse 14. Oh, yeah. How have you got kind of like, oh, okay, listen, just, <laughs> I was just going to pay you out just there, just so that you had the whole verse and not the part of the next bit. But it's okay. We can deal with it. <laughs> Clothed in fine linen. Jesus is in fine linen, but ours are white. What does it say there? White and clean. We don't look like our Saviour. We look exactly like our Saviour but we don't look like him. Oh, and we follow him on white horses. We're riding in victory and triumph. I want to show you something really important. And that's okay. You can turn the verses off the screen because you don't have this one. I'm going to go back to a passage in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 25. It's a story that I'm sure you're very familiar with, the parable of the talents. And I want to show you something that you've probably never seen before. I'm going to pick up the story in verse 14 of chapter 25. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Did you notice that? He gave them according to their own ability. So we don't all have the same ability, so don't judge yourself, don't compare yourself to somebody else because we're different, okay? We have different measures of grace on us. Um, and immediately he went on a journey. Verse 16, then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. You'd wonder why he did that. Like the others, as soon as they traded it, they got back exactly what they traded. It's like the law of sowing and reaping, isn't it? What you sow, you reap. And that's a general parable, a, a general proverb uh, for all society. Um, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Verse 20. So he, he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Just pause there for a moment, is that it's really important to be faithful over little things. Okay? Be faithful over little things. One of the pastors gives you a little job to do, be faithful with it. Be faithful with it. Like, don't wait for you to get onto the pulpit. Don't wait before, you know, you've got the great ministry. You'll never get there if you're not faithful with the little things. Okay, so be faithful with the little things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 22. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me 
two talents, look, I have gained two more talents beside them. It's just really interesting that no one in this story comes up and says, Lord, you gave me two talents and look, I put it to work, but there was a crisis and uh, the bottom fell out of the market and I'm sorry, I lost one and a half of it. I've only got a half left. No one has that story. If you put it to work, you get a return. If what God has blessed you with in your life, if you put it to work, it comes back, it returns. That's just a little encouragement to some of you. Verse 23, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Exactly the same thing that he said to the guy with the, with the five talents who'd made five extra talents. Okay, so... Then he who had received the one talent came and said, okay, now we're going to find out why he buried it. Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Therefore, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. And I'll stop the story just there because this is what I want, want to just highlight to you is that Jesus is explaining what the kingdom is like. And so we're getting a little aspect of the nature of God in the master in this story. And there was something that that guy with the one talent understood about the master. He understood it well. And that is that the master does not operate under the law of sowing and reaping. The master expects to get a return even where he hasn't sowed. Do you remember when Jesus came uh, to Jerusalem and he went up to the fig tree and he expected to get some fruit? And it says in, in the text, it says, well, like, I mean, there was nothing there because it wasn't the season. He didn't matter. He expected fruit in season or out of season. It's just who he is. He expects, he expects what he hasn't sowed into. And so this, so, so, the master ends up saying, were well, you wicked and lazy servant? You knew, you knew that I reap where I didn't sow. So you should have at least put that talent in the bank. And then I would have got like a couple of percent interest on it. Wouldn't have been much, but I would have got something. Okay, take the talent. And here's the thing that I want to say to you because it's going to, I'm going to tie this in now with the riders on the horses behind because that's who we are. Remember, we're on our white horses with our white robes and we're there behind our, our saviour, Jesus, who's on his white horse uh, with his bloodied robe and his many crowns and that we're all behind him. Remember that image? Okay, take the talent and give it to the one who has 10. So he didn't deserve that. 11th talent he reaped what he didn't sow he reaped a, another talent that he had not done up until then he was operating under a law of sowing and reaping he had five talents he put it to work and he got back five more talents and there is a general as I said a general proverb uh, amongst people that if you know if if you are a giving person, then it will grow and expand and it will come back to you. You cast your bread on the waters, it will return. You know, uh, test me in this, says the Lord. See if I won't open up the floodgates of heaven. Like there's all these different promises that are true, you know, that are, that are true, that if we, if we sow, you know, don't be mocked. Sorry, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For what a man sows, he will reap. If he sows to the flesh, he will of the flesh reap destruction. If he sows to the spirit, he will of the spirit reap eternal life. Okay, That's, so there's, there's a general truth in that. 
And I think we get that as Christian people, but we don't understand that there's an 11th talent. We don't understand that our God is someone who reaps what he doesn't sow. You do not deserve necessarily to be healed, but Jesus deserves for you to be healed. You do, you, you know, you, you'll go into a, a, an area or a situation that is just barren and lifeless and other people have been praying. You know, how many people, like where we are in Johnson City, it's in the backwoods of Tennessee. It literally is in the backwoods of Tennessee. It is the very town where Al Capone used to go and get his, his uh, grog from uh, back in the days of the Prohibition. Like this is not like a thriving metropolis. This is a problem community. And everyone is just like, well, don't plant a church, like plant a church in Atlanta. A plant a church in, in New York, like go somewhere of significance. Johnson City, where is that? Most of America doesn't even know the name Johnson City, Tennessee. It is a little hick town. Like it's much bigger than any of our country towns. It's about 60,000 people. But like, and as our senior, senior leader, Pastor Matty Montgomery, who Chris and I have been called to go over and, and help him establish his dream for five years, as he's looking at the list of, God, where are you sending me? He realizes there's, he's got to get rid of all the cities that are already significant because if he planted a church there, then it would be an already significant city, but he would forfeit the opportunity to make a city significant because of the church that he's planting there. So he comes along expecting an 11th talent, coming along not expecting to work hard and slog for 30, 40, 50 years to try and establish a, a work and to get this going, but to reap what he didn't sow. There's so much of the Christian life is about faith and believing for what is the incredible promises of God. So we need to be people like that. We need to be people that are not just saying, well, I've done the work, you know, I've fasted and prayed, I'm filled with the Spirit, I'm like, I'm ready for this, I'm, I'm down in, in the square tonight, you know, and yeah, like, I'm all, I'm all prayed up, you know, just, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go, I'm fired up, I'm, I'm ready, I've, 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 I've just gone and bought Pastor Ian's book, Here Am I, Send Me, I'm, I'm learning how to share the gospel. It's just like, no, expect the miraculous. Expect what you don't deserve. Expect what you have not worked for. Because you're following a rider on a horse who's already done the job. He deserves it even if you don't. So fall into line with him and start believing for the incredible promises that he has given to you. Promises that will cause you to escape the corruption that's in the world. You become a person that, like us, that everybody looks to as like a mum and a dad. You become uncle and aunt. You become grandparents, even when they're not your children. It's just immediately they see something in you, but you, did not, you didn't earn it. You didn't work for that. It's just that you carry an air of faith you understand your identity, that you've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus, that your life is not your own, that you've abandoned yourself to him in thrill and wonder and joy. And you understand for the first time, you understand why it was that the, that the angels of heaven had to form a choir and just sing it out all over the world that Jesus is born. A saviour has come. You understand why, why John the Baptist will point to a man walking down towards the waters of baptism and say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Stop looking at your sin. Stop looking at your fallenness. Stop looking at all the things that you're getting wrong. Start looking at Jesus, the rider on the horse who has done, he's paved the way for you. Realise that the battle is won. When Jesus said, it is finished, then I kind of figure that he meant it is finished. For this purpose, the Son of, of God was revealed that he might destroy the works of the enemy. Do you think that he actually did what he came to do? Because we need to reinvent a whole host of stuff because so many Christians have got this absolutely, totally, frighteningly armed uh, devil. 
like he, almost like he's a second, a second God, a bad one, and we just need to work really hard and so and so and so behind and into the work of God so that we can start to reap some of the wonder and the blessing and the power of the gospel and not understanding that Jesus said it's finished, not understanding that we're sitting on a white horse and we don't need to have blood on our clothes because Jesus has done it for us. And you don't deserve a bit of it. Of course you don't. But he does. So you get the 11th talent. You get what you didn't sow. You might have been sowing corruption all your life and you're not even a Christian right now. And you've made all sorts of wrong, immoral choices and you've done shocking things. And you don't deserve mercy. You don't deserve so many things. You certainly don't deserve that God would favour you and put you on a pedestal and show you off to the universe. But I'm telling you this right now, you're just the person. There is an 11th talent for you to inherit, to be given to you by grace that was not what you earned. So don't be held back by your own past. Don't be held back by your own choices. Don't be held back by the experiences of what's gone behind and how you have failed to, to maybe do what was right or what God wanted from you. Don't be held back by any of that. Start expecting an 11th talent. So I've got a, a word for Christian Family Centre. Start expecting an 11th talent. Start expecting a harvest that you did not sow into. Start expecting some outcomes financially that you did not deserve. It just happened. You as an individual and you collectively as a church, as an individual, start to expect that your business will thrive. Start to expect that the pr promotions will be there even though there might be someone more qualified, but just expect that you will have unbelievable, unfair advantage because you're on a white horse following behind another white horse. You look just like your saviour. You look just like him. You're sitting on a horse. You got your white robes on. You look just like him. And who is he? He is one who's, who reaps what he does not sow. And that's who you can be. Amen.